All right, we're going to do a little bit of on-stage shuffling here. And while that goes on, I'm going to introduce our two keynote speakers. Is Colorado really headed the way of California? Should we just get it over with and call ourselves East California? To discuss Colorado's political and cultural transformation are our two keynote speakers. Both have spent time in Colorado and then left. What does that tell you? First, we have a nationally syndicated columnist and senior editor at The Federalist. He's also a popular author and a former political columnist and editorial board member at the Denver Post, the incredible shrinking Denver Post. He's also been a member, uh, a guest on my podcast, but no one's perfect. Please welcome back to Colorado an AII favorite, David Harsanyi. Next, you've read our next keynote speaker in numerous publications, including National Review, Reason, and the Weekly Standard. He contributes to the essential pod, uh, blog, powerlineblog.com. I read it every day. It's amazing. He's also had newspaper articles in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal. Please welcome back to Colorado Stephen Hayward, CU Boulder's first visiting scholar in conservative thought. And now he's at the Institute for Governmental Studies at UC Berkeley, the former home of free speech. <laughs> well, I have you can be fired. Yeah. Hey, thank you both for being here. Um, let's just dive right into this. And we, we did a bit of a trial run on this uh, as we taped our TV show, Devil's Advocate, which I know you all watch on Friday nights because I can't imagine any of you actually have dates. So I want to thank you both for being here. Both of you have experience in Colorado. You lived here. You were a columnist. You were an editorialist. You worked here for a year going from um, California here and now back to Berkeley of all places. They must love you. Be sure to grab that microphone. So my sub supposition is, I think it's on, my supposition is that we are having a sizable demographic change in Colorado. Now we've always had demographic changes, but this one is different because it's not a demographic change of just people coming in. It's about people coming in, bringing their ideas with them, which I don't think has ever happened before. Usually Colorado is where people go to get away from ideas. Now this is a place where they buy a nice place and bring it with them. So let me ask you, let me start over with David. Am I wrong on this observation? You're not wrong, John. Uh, I came here in 2004 for the reasons lots of people come here. Uh, you know, I changed careers. Greg Moore at the Denver Post gave me this great opportunity. He took a risk. Um, and even then I noticed this change. Uh, I lived in Denver. All my neighbors were from Chicago, you know, Orange County, New York, where I'm from, D.C., places like that. Uh, and they all loved Colorado as well, but they all voted the same way they had voted before. And essentially, very little had changed. And I always wondered, didn't they ever wonder why it was better here? Didn't they ever think, well, maybe it's the policies that are going on here that make it better? Uh, unfortunately, I think because of sort of the tribal way politics is these days in a way it's attached to culture people don't actually think about policy in that way anymore and i think maybe that's the change we're seeing with the new influx of people coming to colorado you know, I, I think about my father who came here in 1970 to get away from those big city politics all right you you live in the belly of the beast you can it's colorado turning into california yeah you're you're right to, you're right to be worried about the california diaspora as i call it um to paraphrase our president, the problem is California is not sending you their best. <laughs> you know, they're, they're sending hipsters, trust fund brats, Silicon Valley and Hollywood trash, and surfers who want to gender re-identify as snowboarders. <laughs> um, <laughs> though some I assume are good people, just to round out all that, right? Um, I, I, th I think there's a broader so, theme so, at work some of my Some of my dearest friends are hipster douchebags. Yes, I know what you're saying. <laughs> so, uh, I, I think there's a broader theme here. I tend to think in maybe overly general grandiose ways, but um, th there's, a, there's a decadence at work in the country that you see worked in California, but you also see it here a little bit, homegrown. I'll come back to that. But why is it that some of the very wealthiest people in the country now are far to the left? That's the Silicon Valley people in particular. Um, but, you know, here in Colorado, there's Jared Polis, who we mentioned, right? 
He was very far to the left, but made a lot of money as an entrepreneur. And uh, Tony Gill, the billionaire, right, is very left and has had a very uh, you know, national impact. Uh, and, I, you know, I think we have to come to grips with a, a certain amount of decadence. Uh, well, I like to say, why can't billionaires vote Republican don't, like don't, they're supposed don't to? Don't trash decadence. We are pro-decadence. Well, I understand that, but right. uh, the decadence at least to liberalism. We haven't figured out that problem. So help me understand, if we are turning into California, what have you noticed? You were here, what, five years ago. You left about six years ago. Yeah. What's the biggest change you've noticed coming back just today? Uh, just driving through Denver, I can't believe what I saw. I mean, it's just changed in immense ways. It feels like a big city now, whereas when I lived here, it felt like a city, but it, it had sort of a smaller town feel, you know, suburban feel, neighborhoods were very important. I, I just can't believe how much they're building here and, and, and how much of an urban feel the city has, the traffic, the noise, the pollution, all of that stuff. You, you took light rail. <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I wanted to get here on time. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, you know, I, we spoke about this earlier, but for me, I, I noticed this stuff going on already, and I, th I think it had a lot to do with Ref C losing uh, the ability of government to... Uh, so slow down there. It, okay. This has a lot to do with Ref C, which passed 12 years ago, right. which busted a hole through Tabor. We've now lost $18 billion and growing every year thanks to referendum. See, why did that make a change? Do you think it's, I mean, I'm asking you a question, but do you think it's more attractive for people who are of a, you know, liberal or, or, or progressive to come to a place where they feel more at home because they can spend money on the things they want, that the government doesn't seem so conservative? I, I used to think that people who came here who I knew who were liberal sort of looked down at Colorado governance. They thought it was sort of backwards, you know? They thought Tabor was sort of, I don't know, you know, ugly and mean, right? But no, I feel- that's, that's just Doug Bruce. That's right. <laughs> um, perhaps it's even more appealing now than it was when I first came here because of those changes. What, what did you notice? It's been five years for you. Well, some of the same things. I mean, I noticed it happening when I was here and I've, I've visited various times over the years. It wasn't my first uh, visit to Colorado five years ago. Uh, but uh, you really do notice now the, what they call the uh, densification of the city, you know, building up all the condos and apartments. And that's fine, by the way, although that will increase traffic dramatically. That's what people see. But what's not happening is something I think I have to step back a moment and explain. One of the plagues that started in California more than 40 years ago, and then the spread to the East Coast, and is now, and also to Colorado at some point, like places like Boulder, it is now infecting the whole country, and it is the opposition to suburban growth. There's the whole sprawl controversies that grew up 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and it's perfectly fine for a city to densify. I think some of that's been very good. It, there's some funny stories, you know, 50 years ago, white flight from the cities was called racist. And now white hipsters come in the cities and gentrify, and that's racist too, so you can't win, right? Um, uh, but uh, look, I mean, California hasn't run out of land entirely, but the coast did get filled up in Orange County and San Diego and places like that. So it makes sense that housing prices would get expensive. But I don't think you're short of land here on the Front Range. And the we natural are dynamic short of, of land allowing. In that we still have 98% of Colorado, yeah. which has not been even touched to being developed. But thanks to California like urban growth boundaries, yes, precisely. we're now bottled up inside these metro areas and can only grow up, not You out. have a regulatory surplus, not a scarcity of land. Right. And that's our fault. Yeah. We, we taught the whole country this. And by the way, there's, a, there's one last We Californians. Point. Yeah, we Californians. I'm, I'm a native Californian, sadly. Uh, th there's, a, there's an emerging a, lot, a bit of scholarship that hasn't made the popular media much at all uh, with, with uh, mainstream economists coming to the conclusion that one of the reason for uh, uh, lowering rates of economic growth in the country in the last 30, 40 years and stagnating wages has been land use regulation. They're really focusing in on this and it's everywhere. People at Harvard and Michigan and, and you know, liberals don't want to hear this because they want to control land because, well, yeah, okay. end, of, end of speech. What's amazing is that minorities get hurt the most from these policies. They can't afford to live downtown, they're pushed farther and farther out, which isn't a problem if there's transportation coming in, which now, thanks to our roads, there isn't. Well, or it's also not a problem for minorities in a city like Houston, where they don't overregulate, right? Interesting fact Joel Kotkin dug up here. I forget the time period, but it was a recent time period where the Houston metro area built more new housing than all of California at the same time, right? 
and housing prices, pretty stable and low there. Also, it's a very friendly place to start a business for anybody, but especially a minority who doesn't have an advanced degree from Harvard to cope with all the regulatory nonsense that the rest of us have to go through. Actually, that's, that's pretty fascinating. When you look at the data, you know, in the last, since 2000, this, the country has grown by about 15%. Colorado has grown by over 30%. And places with failed states like Michigan, Ohio, Illinois have flatlined. They've actually gone backwards. And last year, Colorado saw the most amount of growth, but we've also saw the most amount of people becoming refugees from Colorado. People, uh, the Denver Post did an article showing that they said, we're tired of the traffic. We're tired of the housing prices. We're tired of about everybody being so sensitive. That was my favorite quote. And where is it that they go? Wyoming and Texas. Why? Because there's low, the regulatory infrastructure is lower. It's, it's, it's easier to start a family. It's easier to buy a house. It's, you get to go to a better school. You have less traffic. There are a million reasons why. Um, but, but just to take one little step back, I think also when, when, when you talk about minorities and people moving away, it has something to do, and I see this in Maryland where I live, it's impossible for a middle-class family to survive in that kind of environment sometimes. Rich people can live in California, they can pay the fees, the taxes, they can even deal with the crime because they live in gated communities or in beautiful areas. Uh, and poor people, you have expanding you know, Medicaid and welfare programs, they can live there. But the middle class has to foot the bill for that and they can't. I know people in New York where my family lives, I, I, you know, they're paying $2,500 for a small apartment, they have children, it's impossible to start a business that way or be an entrepreneur or anything like that. So um, why do they move to Oklahoma? Because it's beautiful and uh, you know it has all the things that Colorado has, but even more in a way. All right, so let's go ahead a few years. You live in California. You're seeing our future. You live in DC. They're destroying our future. <laughs> What is it that we can expect in the next 10 years? Put us into the time capsule. We pop out 10 years from now in Denver. What uh, the hell have you done to us? Well, if it's an exact copy, you can look forward to, first, gasoline that's at least a dollar a gallon more than in Colorado. I think it's about $1.40 a gallon more for no good reason. Higher taxes, but also stupid fuel regulations. Never mind that. Uh, you can look forward to a high-speed rail that goes nowhere. We're building one of those. We have slow speed rail that goes nowhere. So yeah, well, we're so we're, we're going to we're get you nowhere faster. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you can look forward to, ah, the latest madness from California is uh, the legislature, I'm not sure they've passed this yet, but they, they have a law that's barreling along to make it a criminal offense to give a customer in a restaurant a plastic straw if the customer hasn't asked for it because some people think that plastic straws are somehow a threat to the planet. How's this gonna work in prison by, what are you in for? Oh, I gave a plastic straw to a kid and I got six months, right? Really? I mean, there's, this is what we're at, you know, that kind of frivolity of legislating for virtue, right? Uh, but the thing you can look forward to, I think you're getting this a little already, but the explosion in homelessness in California in the last 18 months has just been extraordinary. And I think the figures are that California accounts for about two thirds of it nationwide, and I think there's some of it here. But you see these vast encampments of homeless people, sometimes going for miles along a stretch of a you know, creek bed or river, I've seen them pop up around uh, Berkeley and the Bay Area has like 55,000. It's a big issue in San Francisco right now. There's one I drive by on my way to campus at Berkeley every day. They've been there for months. They have a big solar panel to charge up their smartphones, which I think is nice of them to have. Um, but those are the kinds of signs of decay you're gonna see. And we have a spiking crime rate that the governments are trying to conceal in various underhanded ways. What are their facilities? Ah, well, okay, so it, it, the, the little place I drive by in uh, Berkeley, there's maybe 40 or 50 people there in 20 tents. The city has put in some portable toilets for them. They're not doing that in San Francisco, and so you just had a nice dinner. I'm sorry about this, although the kale chips were a bit much, I thought, for the theme tonight, John, but okay. Um, if you want to Google San Francisco poop map, you can now get a map of where the human feces, needles, trash uh, are, you know, predominant and where the city actually smells, right? And you're, you're hearing people, the, the visitors convention bureau are screaming at the city government saying, every convention that comes here is now telling us they're not coming back because it's now so unpleasant for people to be, you know, around Union, you know, Union Square there by the St. Francis Hotel. It's that out of hand. 
Um, and you know, Denver's colder in the winter, but still, you could have. Fortunately, that we have no homeless problem here in Denver, so <laughs> we we don't we don't need to worry about that. All right, take take the time machine ten years. What do you see um, here? Well, generally, I think you're you're screwed because it's such a great place to be. People are going to want to come here. Liberal folks are going to want to come here. The nicer the city becomes, the more it has the sort of. And I'm sure there's wonderful nightlife here and restaurants and all that stuff. They love it. They'll 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 come here. On the other hand, though, you know, Colorado has sort of a diversity of industry and, and a lot of different sorts of populations here that you don't always see in other states. So um, perhaps that will be a, a way to stop it. And, and you're not, you know, it's still a low tax state generally, right? I mean, I know people cheat, and <laughs> I hate to say that here, but just compared to Maryland where I live. Another thing I think you'll see is the sort of nanny state regulations that inhibit people, but more than that, gun regulations. For instance, Maryland, to get a gun, I can't tell you how hard it is. It, it takes forever. They make it impossible. It should be unconstitutional. I think you'll see, obviously, it'll be more difficult here, but I think there's a sort of incrementalism going on with progressives that's working, and I don't see that happening with conservatives. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's trouble. You see it, you know what the state you see it most in is Nevada. Nevada has this massive, you know, uh, influx from, from, from big cities that are failing, and it's changing changing everything there in a way. What, what's a tax rate, California? Uh, so five or six years ago now, California voted to temporarily raise the personal income tax to a top rate of 13%. You won't be surprised to learn that the temporary part has disappeared. No one could see that coming, right? Um, and uh, I will say that's a, a good news, bad news story. It's ridiculous. It's on sort of higher income starting, I think, at $500,000 for individuals. That's called entry level in Silicon Valley, but right. Um, the good news is this. Uh, the state just last week put out a forecast that because of the Trump tax reform that scaled way back the state and local tax deduction, uh, Californians are going to be on the hook for next year for $12 billion in additional federal income tax payments. And we couldn't be happier. Oh, I'm delighted with this, although that's why I'm, I'm planning to leave when I retire. I don't plan, I mean, those, I mean, I don't make that kind of money, but I still don't plan to pay those kind of income tax rates in retirement. That's well, while that's satisfying, yes. the people that's going to hit are Silicon Valley folks with lots of money who realize they can get a 10% surplus in their taxes just by moving here and bringing their wealth and their politics here. So while it's satisfying, I think it only speeds up what what we call Hurricane California is, is all about. Uh, yes, although, you know, one of the things that happens is a lot of people like to go to work in the tech industry and they want to live in San Francisco because it's cool and hip. And some of those people have might you been come to Lodo? Here too. It's cool and hip. Yeah, I know. But, you know, so one of the things that happens right now, I'm kind of enjoying this, by the way, uh, again, is that, you know, Google and they run buses for their employees in San Francisco, uh, you know, come in the carpool lanes 45 minutes every day down to campus and back. By the way, Google calls their headquarters a campus, which may not be a coincidence for their politics, right? Um, but by the way, sometimes the, you know, sort of the angry left in San Francisco will throw rocks at those buses. Really? Yeah, they protest that this is terrible because these are the gentrifiers, right? Who've wrecked San Francisco for all the hipsters and people who aren't tech millionaires. And so, yeah, I think there's a prospect that'll happen, but I also think that partly it's Stanford and, you know, the whole sort of tech infrastructure there. I think you won't see that big a, I think there'll be branch offices and stuff, but I don't think Amazon, for instance, is going to put their third campus here or their second headquarters here. Are they? I haven't been keeping track of that. They keep I, saying I Washington. Think, yeah, I think Maryland is up for it in a few other places, but, I mean, I think people who make, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars or even millions of dollars they can afford to pay high taxes. They're not going to move simply because they live a good life. It's the person who doesn't make that much, I think, who's affected the most. I mean, um, in Maryland, where I think around D.C., I'm not sure what the exact number is, five of the seven counties are the richest counties in, in the country. It's, it's not just income tax, it's property tax. Property taxes in New York, where I live, for instance, a small house will be, you know, $20,000. Uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult for a middle class person to survive. If I had a few hundred million dollars, I'd live wherever I wanted. I wouldn't really care much about the tax rate. You were mentioning about the Trump tax cuts, and it affects us, and people here don't quite realize it, that uh, when we pay our state income tax, we take a line item from the federal form, the aggress uh, adjusted gross income, pull that off, put it onto the state form. 
that number on the federal form under the new rules goes skyrocketing, which is fine because they apply a lower tax rate to it and we get a huge tax cut on the federal level. But on the state level, we now start off with a much larger amount. And that means we're going to be paying hundreds of millions of dollars more in state income tax. The state thinks it'll be close to $900 million in just a few years. You heard us give an award to Jerry Sonnenberg. The bill that he sponsored opened up enough room in the state budget that it can absorb all that money. If he didn't do it, it all would have been refunded thanks to the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Instead, the state is going to ex uh, have this windfall. Colorado will see no benefit from the tax cuts that Trump put through thanks to this Republican betrayal. So I'm, I'm assuming what you guys are suggest is that we put our hopes in Republicans to save Colorado. Uh, I do not. I think that Republicans have, uh, we talked about RFC, some Republicans were very big on, on overturning Tabor, which I think was basically when, you know, it was, it was essentially overturned. And obviously we see what Congress is doing now. You can't trust Republicans. You mentioned it before. I think you need sort of embedded infrastructure, you know, of budgets that, that, that stop people from doing the wrong thing because people are terrible. And, um, <laughs> but... They're, Spoken like a true New Yorker. Yeah, they, they are, they are, uh, there are a few of them. In fact, it's the opposite, right? Uh, most liberal and progressive programs are self-propelled. They're automatic. They start to crowd out everything else in a budget, um, like Medicaid expansion and, and, and things like that. So, um, but, so that's why I love Tabor so much, and that's why I thought it was such a great idea. Didn't we rely on politicians to save Colorado? Uh, well, of course the answer to that is no. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you, you're describing the way the state tax scheme is organized here, and then I remembered, oh yeah, I kind of remembered filing uh, state taxes for the year that I lived here and thought it was a little odd how they did it, because it's different than when the other states did it. So on the narrower question, and I don't want to be wonky here on this because it gets boring in a hurry, but the state could change the way it did that to mitigate the uh, pain of the federal income tax change, but that doesn't reach the broader question that there was a line, bill to right? do just such that was some it? of the some of the senators here were working on it. It did not fly. Well, wait till a couple of years of income tax returns have to be filed by Colorado taxpayers, and as Ronald Reagan used to say, when they start to feel the heat, then they see the light. All right, let me let me put out this this uh, thought that I have, and it's just as depressing as you two. I believe that states like. Illinois, Chicago, uh, or um, Michigan, and, and Ohio, they're at the end of a, maybe a half century worth of bad policies that have finally come home to roost. We're starting to see real positive movement in, the, in those states. Michigan ha now has right to work. Uh, unlike Colorado, they ended their subsidy for Hollywood uh, uh, to movie makers. Um, but it took a long time. I'm worried that Colorado is where California was maybe 1960-ish, that the bad policies are starting. We can see it, see it coming, but there's so much room to make these mistakes. Companies are coming in, people are coming in, money's coming in, so when, when localities want to outlaw guns, uh, up in um, Lafayette, they outlawed putting sugary drinks on kids' menus, I mean, wherever it is, there's plenty of room for that. It's not gonna be until decades later that we feel enough pain that we're willing to change it. That's my fear, that we're at the beginning of this. Tell me I'm wrong. Uh, I, I'm gonna have to struggle to figure out a way to tell you you're wrong. <laughs> um, that, that seems perfectly plausible. I mean, uh, people have been warning about these problems in California, well, since Governor Reagan came into office, right? Uh, and I, I'm not quite sure what to say, except to say, Two things. One is, you're right. It, it, actually, of all the people, it was Keynes who said there's a lot of rot or ruin in a nation. I think it was Keynes, of all people. And you can afford to make a lot of mistakes while you're prosperous and your wealth is growing. And if you're importing a lot of wealth, that means you can paper over a lot of mistakes for a long time for a lot of people, not for the most vulnerable. That's the hypocrisy of liberal governance, of course, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, every once in a while, why did you get a Republican governor in Illinois, in Michigan? Uh, uh, in uh, Massachusetts, in Maryland. Maryland. Larry Hogan's one of the most popular governors in America, and that's because people say, hey, wait a minute, things are out of hand, 
and maybe we need one of these conservatives or Republican types who will clean it up for us, like Rudy Giuliani in New York, ultimately, in the early 1990s, when things got so out of hand. Now, I'll just add you one more thing. Wait, 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 so we got to get to what New York City was in the 70s before things start getting better. Well, I like to think that Colorado might be a little quicker than New Yorkers about this, but... But let me give you one more but thing. But they're not avoid. Coloradans. They're Californians well, now. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah, so right. uh, there's really one, I mentioned one quickly, really bad idea from California that you absolutely must stop. California went to what they call a jungle primary, except I think we have to call it a rainforest primary, don't we? Because that, uh, I don't know if you followed all this, but Schwarzenegger did this to us. Uh, we now have this primary where everybody's on the ballot at once, both parties, independents. And the top two vote getters go to the final ballot in November. Two years ago, for the U.S. Senate seat, there were two Democrats, no Republican on the ballot. As of right now, if you go by the current polls, there will be no Republican on the ballot in November for any statewide office. Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Attorney General, Treasurer, Secretary of State, Insurance Commissioner, um, you know, and there will be all Democrats. That will be your choices. That's how weak the Republican Party has become, unfortunately. And I think a Republican could win in California under the old system where you have the two parties put up their nominees. Uh, I think there's some reopenings right now. Um, but this crazy system is going to give us two Democrats, it looks like. One will be Gavin Newsom, and personally, I think California deserves a governor named Gavin. <laughs> At Independence Institute, we, we constantly say that politics is the lagging indicator of change that political culture is the leading indicator of change. And that's why the state has turned blue, is that the left understood to put their money in infrastructure, think tanks, legal firms, specialty groups that did registration drives, data collection firms. None of it had anything to do with a party. None of it had anything to do with a candidate. But over time, it pulled this state this way. I look at the Californian culture where you add all that plus entertainment and they pulls the culture this way. If there is a way to save Colorado, how do we change the culture, the political culture, to say this is the way we want Colorado? When, when Democrats were in control here before, it was a different type of Democrat. It might have been Roy Romer or, or um, Dick Lamb, but there was a lot of agriculture or even labor union Democrats. Today's Democrats in control of uh, Colorado are hardcore social engineering progressives. It's always difficult for conservatives to make an argument because their argument is we need less, and that's a hard argument for a politician to make. Um, uh, you know, so you're always starting off on the wrong foot, and, you, and, and because your conservatives are not by nature activists in government, they tend to lose out. You have, I remember in Colorado, you know, every time there was a school choice victory, the Supreme Court would knock it down. It was impossible to move forward even when you were ahead. So if they don't use the courts, then they use the media, if they, you know, the newspaper, if they don't, you know, so there's always some activist class undermining what you're doing. But in the end, the best way to persuade people is to show them results. So, um, you know, in Colorado, in, in many ways you have. So, you know, in a state like Maryland, where I live, they can, they can there is some, intu I think that Americans intuitively try to balance things out sometimes, right? So I think we have in Maryland a Republican governor because it's so liberal in every other way that somehow people decided to balance it out. But we can afford to make mistakes because we have so many rich people there and there's so much money flowing in from DC. I'm not sure states like Michigan could afford that kind of thing or I'm not sure Colorado can either. So maybe change will come quicker here. I'm trying to find a positive, some kind do, of positive spin on this. Do we have to go through this dark period? In other words, one of my fears is as we lose, we lose slowly. When we lose slowly, you don't know it. It is the frog slowly coming to a boil in a pot, and you don't know it. That's why the left is so good at incrementalism, and we don't fight back the same way. So should, should we just hold up our hands and let the progressive wave come and uh, uh, take us over? No, but I mean, at some point, people do not abandon their politics that easily. I mean, studies show that even generationally, they don't abandon that, abandon their ideas that easily. So it's a it's a big task to, to persuade and convince people to change their minds. Best thing people can do is have lots of kids here, and call, conservatives have lots of kids and make them all conservative. But um, I mean, that, you that, all that, know what you're doing <laughs> after the dinner. That's right. 
ply them with liquor and then let them loose. So I, I think, though, uh, that it generally is a very difficult task. So, I mean, that's why I love what you guys do, but it is, it is a tough task because even when you are winning, it's very difficult to point. When you stop something bad, it's very difficult to, 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 to say that's a victory, right? Even though it is often a victory. But when they pass something that helps someone in a wheelchair, they say, well, we won, and they, they have their victory. It's also one of the problems we have when we do have a victory, we don't protect it. Tabor being the perfect example, it, it, you know, in war, you, you win a battle and then your next job is to protect that win. Uh, we passed Tabor and then we went on with our lives while the left realized we'll take a quarter of a century and dismantle it court ruling by court ruling by court ruling. They have the patience. We need to change that so that we understand when we have that win, it now means we have to double our efforts, double our resources to build an infrastructure to, to protect it. Um, should we just go forward and hurry up and fail? So, uh, so I made the point a minute ago that maybe crisis creates an opportunity, and you came back with, what if we're losing slowly, which makes it harder? Uh, now, I'll put it this way. If and that's a very plausible scenario. I think that's probably the right one. If you think you're steadily losing ground slowly, it does mean you have some time. Now, what do you do with that time? Now, we've been in the think, I've been in the think tank business, you're in the think tank business, and we generate lots of policy ideas, and we're good at that, and we've had some successes and a lot of setbacks. I want to step back for a minute, and, you know, I, I was uh, as sort of shocked and disoriented by Trump's victory as I'm sure you know, a lot of people here in this room. And everyone fixes in on the fact that he did change some voting habits. We look at those swing states in the upper Midwest. But there's one number that I keep coming back to that's been lost in this. Trump got a higher share of the Hispanic vote than Mitt Romney did four years before. How did that happen? There have been some follow-up surveys. There's a big gender gap. He did much better among Hispanic men than women. And, you know, sort of, I still haven't seen good survey data on this. It's a, it's a matter of panic for the identity politics left, by the way. I've seen a couple of them say, wait a minute, we should be really worried about this. I don't think they want to know. And, and, you know, the conservative side hasn't delved into this the way they should, I think. But part of it is similar to Trump's appeal in the upper Midwest. It wasn't wonky. He wasn't giving our kind of, he was the least think tank oriented candidate in the last two generations, right? That's not so much a reproach to us as a suggestion to say, well, I'll take a hint from that and say, instead of, as we've been doing for a long time, trying to sell school choice to minorities, and they may like the idea, but that may not change their broader orientation. I think we'll take a hint from Trump and say, we need to figure out a way to engage minorities on broader themes where the ideas are secondary. The first one is, Something like, you know, we're on your, that's what they saw in Trump was, he's different, he's actually on our side. He's actually somebody we can relate to better than all these politicians of either party who give us a laundry list of ideas. And I think, just thinking aloud, one of them would be, here in Colorado, we are for your opportunity to buy a house you can afford and to start a business without having two years of red tape and a lot of capital and a bank loan you can't get. You want to do a food truck? We'll have a regulatory system that allows you to do a food truck, which most cities make very difficult to do. Uh, things of that kind, I think, w might actually work. We got, you know, politics is about addition. You've got to add more people to your coalition. Republicans in California have been pretty dismal at that. And I think things are not as lost to conservatives in Colorado as they were in California. So we just build a Trump-like wall on the western well, slope? Well, I don't know about that. Well, yes, you know, I think you want Trump to and build a wall on the California border. For. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Well, just on that topic, you know, when you look at polls of millennials, they're basically fascists in many ways. But they also have some views that are off that like like the food truck made me think of that you know they are pretty open to sort of economic ideas that conservatives can um relate to and perhaps that's a way in to sort of try to turn them over because a lot of the, a lot of how you vote has to do with culture where you live urban rural that sort of thing when they overreach there are opportunities i live in boulder do with that whatever you like um and as they're turning me into a criminal for a gun i own uh, they forget. I've heard uh, Democrats say that the gun issue in Colorado is a third rail issue. Three sitting state senators were recalled because of their anti-gun policies. I could see, as they keep pushing these regulations, those people, those Trump-type voters go, no, this is, this is outrageous. 
And I think we need to embrace that. Yeah, I actually think the gun issue is we, more important than people think. We, can, we, can we say, we, every year we do our alcohol, tobacco, and firearms party where we smoke, drink, and shoot, mostly because it pisses off nannyists. Um, this little New York boy over here never touched a gun until he came to one and then finally purchased a, a, a shotgun afterwards. So, um, and then his wife made him give it away. I will own many guns when I move to Virginia on the American side of the border, but now I live in Maryland where it is extremely difficult to have guns. But anyway, the gun issue, you know, people are rarely anti something completely or for something completely. And I think the gun issue, they're, they're complete, they misjudge what most Americans out here think because they're, they're in their bubbles. And uh, I, I think that uh, you will, every time they bring up the gun issue, they lose. The NRA, I think I had its like best fundraising month ever, you know, and um, yeah. And uh, so there are issues like that. So maybe more issue oriented stuff rather than party oriented stuff is, is the way to go to change minds. And by the way, I'll tell you what, let's take two or three questions. So if, if you're thinking one, we'll, we'll do that right after this. Um, last bit of advice. You're looking at us, you can see that they're very thrilled by the message that we're turning into California. You've brightened their day. They can, they can see the homeless coming. They can see the taxes coming. Give us one shred of, of hope as the Californian ideological invasion takes over this state. Um, well, maybe I'll move back. At least I can make some liberals miserable and cheer up some of our friends. Remember, he was at CU, my uh, uh, socialist alma mater, so that would be yeah, good. I was an inmate there for years, I put it. And right. um, I, had, you, I, you should, I can't believe you lived there. I, I had great fun, to tell a quick story. I had great fun when I was there when these liberal groups would invite me to see who the zoo, the zoo, the zoo animal was. And I would say, I'll let you in on a secret. I shouldn't. It's against the union contract for conservatives. But Boulder is every conservative's favorite college town. It's because of that green belt you have for quality of life. It makes it so much easier to enforce the quarantine on Boulder liberals. You're right. Yeah. Right. And, and also, if, if, if Boulder burns, it won't take down the whole city. Give us something to hold on to. Uh, progressive ideas fail all the time because they don't work. And uh, if ideas don't work, sooner or later, you hope people come to their senses and uh, embrace ideas that do work. So what pap is that? <laughs> All right, let's grab a couple quick questions. If anyone has a, has a quick question, right over here. Real, stand up and be as loud as you can. So I'm a high school student. How should I tell a college that I'm a straight, white, Christian, conservative male? You don't want to tell them you're a white, <laughs> yeah, conservative, should, Christian male. We should repeat male. the no. question, because I think they The question was, the I'm a high school student. How do I tell a college that I'm a white, straight, conservative male? Uh, the answer is, just go gay. Yeah, that's a, my, uh, very carefully, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're the academic here. Uh, yeah, well, how, actually... How bad is it, I know how bad it is at yeah. CU's campus, how bad is it on your campus? Well, uh, first of all, uh, something people don't perceive, great big schools like Berkeley or Boulder, they're actually not as bad as a lot of the private liberal arts colleges. In other words, I don't know where you're thinking of going to college. The, the most important thing you decide is that question, where you're going to go. Uh, but some of the private colleges, Middlebury, Oberlin, just name any of the private elite colleges, they're much worse on this kind of question. Yeah, you have lots of crazy folks at Boulder and Berkeley, but the place is so big it's easy to avoid them, and you'll find lots of other people who are just like you. Um, the College Republicans is the biggest student group at Berkeley, because it's the only one, wow. right? Um, uh, but, uh, so that, but, but seriously, the, the more serious question is which college you choose to go to, and perfectly fine to go to Boulder or Berkeley or Michigan or someplace like that, depending on what you want to study. They have some great departments, sciences, uh, even some of the social sciences, economics. I won't, I will, I will can, I'll keep this short, it is, but... It is okay to come out as straight. It's, I'm straight, I'm here, get used to it. Uh, it's, 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 it's can can I okay. just add something? I don't know if anyone here watches the show Silicon Valley on HBO, but um, it's a great show. It's brilliant, I think. But there's an episode where <laughs> they have a group of app makers, tech guys, and one of them is gay and he's creating a gay dating app, but he tells the guy he's Christian and the guy actually accidentally spills the bean to everyone, the beans to everyone else and he's shunned by the entire society there because he's Christian, not because he was uh, creating this gay hookup site and I just thought it was pretty fun. <laughs> One more question. No one? All right, I guess 
Oh, over here. Christian. Christian su suggesting that we poke more fun at at the left. I mean, who else has a poop map? Uh, why why can't we through entertainment do that? I'll have an answer to here's here's my answer to your question of why we don't do better in the world of entertainment because that's not the side of the brain we use. I look at I, I love Thirty Rock for instance, and they're, they're all liberals, and they put out this spectacular show. They go for the laugh first, and then they do the message underneath. When conservatives try to do art or funny, they always try to do the message first and try to make it funny, and it doesn't usually work. Now, listen, when it comes to making jokes, they're great at that, or making music, they're great at that. I wouldn't want them designing our bridges. We build the bridges to do that. But the question is, are there more and more people? When we have our fossil fuels art contest. Does that help bring out that creativity? One of the reasons we did FreedomFi, a crowdfunding site like GoFundMe or Kickstarter, is so that conservatives and libertarian artists can put out their projects and look for backers. Um, why, why do we do so poorly in that? I don't have a good answer for that, but I have the same complaint that we're, we've been really bad at this for a long time. There have been a couple of attempts to try it that I think haven't been very good. There was uh, ten, 10 years ago, Fox News tried the half hour news hour. It was really lame, right? It just, and uh, look, we've got some talented people. Uh, you know, Dennis Miller, his show was pretty good when it was on, but he got tired of doing it. And, um, uh, you know, Rob Long, who's now the executive producer of uh, Kevin Can Wait, is a hardcore conservative, but he's sort of, you know, doing the regular industry way. And, there is, you may know about some of this, there are some efforts to try and train and elevate the careers of libertarian and conservative Hollywood people, screenwriters, producers, directors, sort of at a young age, and hope that they'll filter up in the same way we've done it in sort of academia and some other areas. It's a long-term, pro. I know a lot about, about these projects. Um, so I don't know, but boy, that's something we ought to get good at in a hurry, and we haven't. Hey, I, can we take a moment and just thank both David and, and Steve. Thank you for, for coming here. Appreciate it. And I want to thank you so very much. This was our most successful dinner ever. Again, raising $185,000. And if that one person wants to jump up right now and say, I'm in for that extra 15, now is your opportunity to be that hero. Yeah, that's what I thought. I want to thank you so much. We are blessed, truly fortunate to do what we do at Independence Institute. We love our mission to keep this Colorado culture where we crave freedom to make our own decisions and fight this culture that they crave the ability to make decisions for others. Your investment is a long-term investment. Our job is a long-term mission. We could not do it without you. I want to thank you for being here and hopefully see you next year. Good night.